So number one, don't always do it. You, Q and A is a choice, right? So it gets back to what's the purpose of this presentation. Now, if it is a content-oriented one and you aren't going to build in Q&A time, again, you want some way for them to reach you. So whether that's giving the email, et cetera, some way for them to follow up. If you are going to do Q&A time, then you do have to recognize it's one of your elements, right? So it's not beginning or opening and three points and then closing. It's opening two points, maybe Q&A there and then another one, or three, Q&A, or maybe it's just two points in Q&A. So you really have to, number one, um, plan for that. Mm -hmm. I never close with Q&A. I think it's deadly. It would be one of the deadly sins um, because you can't control the energy at the end if it was somebody else's question. So when I am going to offer Q&A, I always have a closing anyway. And that closing is that my opening and closings, those are down pat. There's, there's no wiggle room in it. I've decided what it's going to be, and it's going to be that. Um, so your timing, again, has to recognize that I need to wrap Q&A up with three minutes left or five minutes left or whatever it is that that closing is going to take. That way you get to close in the way that you want to, and you control the energy. The, another thing that can go wrong is you open up the plate Q&A, and no one asks something. So if I'm going to open the Q&A, I will feed a question in the audience. I will actually say to somebody in the audience, you know, I'm going to open it for Q&A. This is always a really good opener question. So if you notice no one's asking, because usually once there's one question, people will pop. But um, And then if for any reason that's not a strategy that will work, another strategy is to simply be ready with, you know, uh, we got time for Q&A. Well, I see nobody's thought of one yet, but let me tell you a question I often get. And then you essentially ask your own question, which comes from something somebody's actually asked. So it can be tricky. It's okay, I think, to leave it off. It depends on the purpose of the speech. But if you're going to do it, you don't want it to be really at the end. I do try not to leave things a chance, knowing that things will always go wrong. Um, so um, I want to control what I can and I want to be prepared with specific strategies for the things that can go wrong. And those things are the timing goes wonky. Or, you know, the person before you tells this horrific story that makes everybody depressed. Um, or, you know, there really has been a, a, a death amongst the group or there's something that just ticked, the energy is just not where you thought it would be and you've got to recover. Example, I had a full day training the day after 9-11. Everybody in the room had been up all night watching the television. People were upset. You could tell. And yet they had, somebody clearly, I could tell, somebody had talked to them and said, listen, we brought her in. We're paying this for two days. So you need to just put all this aside and really give it your best attention. So ask me not to mention it. So I started and started my own regular sort of opening, which, of course, was totally inappropriate. It's funny and all this stuff, you know. And, and finally, I just did a timeout. I said, there's an elephant in the room. Let's deal with that. And I said just a few things, acknowledged the problem, and then said, you know, but perhaps our best response to this is to do what we do well. And so I'm going to be here to help you do this piece. And then I actually told him, I said, and I know this might be a stretch for some of you, and so I'm going to just, any of you that need to take a free refresher with me at any other time, just know that's going to be an option for you. And that was enough to take it off the table and come back and do what we needed to do. So I think a speaker needs to be able to call the elephant in the room and take a quick time out if necessary and, and deal with it and then come back in. I was doing a training for a bank, which is what I do. Um, I get to the venue and I've been trying to call the chief lending officer for weeks because that's one of the things I usually do, interview, what's your issues, you know, so that I do feel comfortable that I know some things going in. This guy wouldn't return my phone calls. His assistant kept talking to me and I kept thinking, gosh, this is just weird. I get there and he wasn't friendly at all. And then his assistant said, I said, so let me make sure you have another copy of my introduction. She says, oh, we won't be using that one. I said, really? She says, well, he thought it was too frivolous, so he'll, he'll do something different. And I'm known for funny and my introduction has funny things in it, but no. So I immediately I'm thinking, okay, something's really gone wrong. Then I look at this group, 
the tension in the room was palpable. I didn't know what was wrong, but I absolutely knew something was. I started with my usual opening and it was just dying. It was like, you know, so here's what I did. In any audience, even when things aren't going really well, often you'll make a connection with just one or two people, right? Some, somebody will smile or they'll seem uh, that they're interested or they'll nod their head or something. So uh, way earlier than I would ever normally take a break, I had identified about two people that I sort of got connected to. I took an early break. They did not know it was early because remember, I don't tell people what's wrong, right? Or, so I said, you know, y'all had a lot of coffee this morning, so let's go ahead and take, I always like to take the bre first break real early. They don't know that's not true. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as we broke, I went right for the people that I had connected with. And I said, please tell me what's going on. Turns out that everybody in the room had had their lending authority cut in half. They didn't even know why they were at this training because they can't use it. And the person who was going to lord it over them was someone they didn't like and she was in the room. So, very different circumstance, right? Now, I happen to have the ability, remember I plan, and I have a, a depth of experience that really helps to, have just have, to know you will always have way more information than anybody in the room needs. I have the ability to speak to that group too, you know, a group that doesn't have their own lending authority but needs to advocate for other customers, so I just shifted right away. I came back in, I said, you know, I just heard that you have had some changes in who has what lending authority. And so let me tell you why, even if your lending authority is less, this is going to help you. It's going to help you in your career, and it's going to help you advocate for your customers. I basically gave them the pitch. And while it certainly couldn't re reverse immediately the toxicity in that room, it started to. It happened that I was doing another training for the same bank, a different group, two days later. That one I started right from the beginning, knowing what my situation was and was able to handle. I also, by the way, was furious with my client and I absolutely had to manage that because at the time that I was still presenting, that was not gonna serve me. It was certainly not gonna serve the people in the room. So there are times when, as a speaker, something's happened that you simply just have to manage your own emotions, decide what's, because the moment you're in front of this audience, it is so not about you anymore. It is absolutely about what do they need how can I help them get it? And if you're focused on how you feel or how angry you are or wh what are they thinking, or it, it's totally not only wasted energy, but it actually can get in the way of the only reason you're in front of the room, which is to help the audience get what they need. I, uh, I don't do a lot of like, the kind of writing I do tends to be more in the technical arena related to tax return analysis. I do blogs. Um, I do blogs for myself and also for my professional association, the National Speakers Association. So I definitely do write, um, but, but I'm not a prolific writer like a lot of people in my field are. They're exactly the same from the standpoint that you need to understand the results you're trying to get for whoever is receiving the information. So in a speech to your audience, in a written form, it's the person. So it tends to be written form, tends to be a person. Audience tends to be bigger group. But you know, even when I'm in front of an audience, or if I'm doing my own video for for my work, I always have a one person in mind anyway. Hmm. I'm really not talking to the 30 out there. I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you, and I'm talking to you. Um, because it's not what the 30 people are going to do. It's about each of the individuals, what they're going to do with the information, motivation that I can provide that will make the difference. I, I agree. Uh, in the training that I do, I train lenders on tax return analysis. It could be a dry subject, but not with me. Um, in fact, I'm a CPA, and my clients have decided that the P in CPA stands for playful. So I'm a certified playful accountant. Um, but um, every person in that room, first of all, I'm fortunate in that, every person in that room actually wants to be there. It's not that they want tax return analysis training, but they want the ability to um, excel in their careers. Everyone in the room does. Everyone in the room wants to better serve their customers, or in the case of credit unions, their members. Everybody does. Um, and frankly, everybody, um, or certainly most people, would like to know that their uh, work does contribute to the um, profits or the health of the organization that hires them. So um, every single person can really benefit if I can package what I know, 
that first of all get rid of all the stuff that I know that they don't need to know, right? So in case tax return analysis, dump a bunch of it, find the part they need, figure out how each one of them can best learn it, and then package it for each one. And some of them it's going to be stories, and some of it's going to, the rest of it's going to be blurry until I can get them on paper and have them work in it. And others, um, it's going to be um, a specific example. Um, so everybody learns differently, and everybody hears things differently. And that's one of the things I do think that as a speaker, um, at one point you and I talked about what do you do to prepare, and my first thought is what do they need, and then how do I get that for them? And because there's more than one person in the room, what this person needs might be a little different than that one or that one. So having different techniques, some people love handouts, and they really do need them. And other people are not even going to look at the handout, and they're just going to listen. Uh, some are going to listen to take notes, and others taking notes would be in their way. So l developing tools that allow you to actually connect with each of the different people in whatever way would best work for them, and still stay within your time frame, and and meet the objectives. That's what a good speech writer is and what a person who can deliver it well is. Well, you know, there's impromptu speaking and then there's impromptu speaking. <laughs> Sometimes the, what you're doing right then is impromptu, but the topic is one you actually knew is likely to come up. And then sometimes it's just like you had no idea what the topic would be. Um, for someone who knows that even though they don't know when or for how long these things, these opportunities will arise, but they know that this is a topic area that could arise, I really recommend that they almost think in terms of sound bites, like you would if you were interviewing with a news organization. If you've thought it through in terms of sound bites or specific points that are important, then when the opportunity arises, you don't ramble all over the place and then later try to figure out what the heck did I do, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if you don't have a plan, then it's really too easy to meander off. Mm -hmm. So um, if it's truly impromptu, the other advice I have is to pause. It's perfectly okay at the beginning to say, let me, let me think about that. Oh, okay, you know, that's, that's totally legit. And I, I, by the way, never been in Toastmasters, so I don't know if they would ding you for doing that, but I think that if your purpose is to communicate well, that pausing to gather your thoughts is a brilliant move.